Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. How many of you, that, and this, you just got to be honest about this, okay? I, I, I don't want you to hide behind anything. I don't want you to hide behind your suit and tie or anything like that. If you don't have a suit and tie, Tim, it's good. You're all right still. But I don't want you to hide behind anything this morning. I just want to ask you a couple questions. Okay, here's the first one. Have you ever done anything wrong? Really? I mean, don't, don't be afraid to, to say that you have or have it. If you have it, then it's okay. I mean, if you've never done anything wrong, then it's cool. I mean, you're one of a kind. You're, um, there's something different about you than there is anyone else in this place. Um, okay, let me ask you this. Have you ever done anything wrong and... Um, Somebody caught you doing it. Okay? Now, let's go again. Put your hand down, Jerry. No, actually, just keep your hand up, Jerry. Okay, here we go. Stay right there. Um, okay, here we go. Let me ask you another. Here's another series of questions. Have you ever done anything wrong and somebody caught you for doing something wrong and they really gave you the once over for doing it? How many husbands can say Amen. And how many wives can raise your hand and say, bless them, Jesus. <laughs> bless them, Lord, because they know not what they do. <laughs> right? Okay, now let me ask you another question. All right, here we go. And we're going to go again. I'm going to change it a little bit. We all, we all know that every one of us in here this morning, unless you're just a liar, have, um, have done something wrong in your life, right? Okay, all right. And we all know that we've done something wrong that we've gotten caught for. Like for me and my, myself, I know that one time in my life I broke two Pepsi bottles and, that, and I didn't know before that it was the wrong thing to do, but I found out later on in the next few minutes that that was the wrong thing to do at that time. And I got beat up over it. Not really beat up, but I've had emotional scars over it. <laughs> I have a reminder in my office now. Of what, anyway, no. Have you ever done anything wrong and you beat yourself up over it? And sometimes that thing that, that we beat ourselves up over is way worse than something that we've done wrong that somebody else finds out about and beats us up over. Because a lot of times the things that we do wrong in our, in our own life is it, something that it'll, it'll go away for a while and then something else will come along and it, it reminds you of it. It sparks a memory or it makes you feel like that you're a second-class citizen. And you can never measure up because you know in your own heart, in your own mind, that you have really struggled with whatever that thing is that, you, that you've done wrong. Or you've come to a place of acceptance with it. With what, and I'm not talking about a series of sins or anything like that, but you come to a place of acceptance with that thing and, and you begin to feel better about yourself and then you go back and you do something else. And you do something wrong again. And then it seems like you beat yourself up even more that time because now do you not only have one felony, you have two. Or in my case, three or four or five or not enough fingers and toes and eyeballs and ears to count them all. But let me tell you something. If you're in any of these categories this morning, and I think if you're honest with me that you are in one of those categories, this message is for you. Because I believe that all of us have done something in our life wrong. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in here that has it. I mean, just walking in the door this morning, you may have tripped and fell, or you may have tripped over your own feet, or may you, maybe you sat in somebody's seat that is right now sitting behind you going... And you don't know you did something wrong. But this message is for you. Hey, and, and while I say that, I want to say hello to a couple of people this morning that I know that are watching right now. 
One is named Donald Lawrence. And Donald uh, typed in this morning on Facebook or a few minutes ago to the guys upstairs and said he's watching from Afghanistan. So, hello, Donald. Isn't that awesome? And the other person that I think is watching this morning for sure is Miss Inez Gray. And if you don't know who Inez Gray is, she is Faye Hart's mother. And Miss Inez Gray is the oldest living member of Fayetteville Community Church. And she, I went to see her in the hospital this week. She's 93 years old. And she's doing great, but she's watching this morning. So, hello, Miss Inez. Anyway. So hopefully, one, we're in one of, one of these categories. We've either, either done something that we've gotten caught for, or we've just done something wrong, or we've done something in our life that we feel like that we have to kind of think bad about ourselves. Anybody with me? Yes. Say yes. yes. Ushers, help me this morning. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, <clears throat> it's going to be on the screen, it's going to be on the handout, but if you've got your Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans 8. And this verse should be underlined, circled, yellowed, torn out, copied, put on your refrigerator. It should be in everything that you have. It, it, it should, when you pull a credit card out at the, at the grocery store, it should pop out of your credit card, so you, um, out of your wallet so you can remind yourself. When, when you get in your car and you look at your speedometer, you should, you should have this verse on your speedometer. When, when, when you go outside to mow your grass, you ought to have it taped to the handle of your, your lawnmower or the steering wheel of your lawnmower or the back of your kid when, while he's mowing his, your grass for you. You need to have this verse somewhere. And I want you to put it up on screen this morning and I want everybody in here to read this. Everybody ready? Look up and read. All right, read this. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To all of you that have ever done anything wrong, this verse is for you. To all of you who have ever struggled in your life with doing something wrong and being beat up for it, or beating up yourself over and over and over, this is for you. This is for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. Yes! Good night, everybody. Happy Memorial Day. If you get that this morning, if you can lock into that verse right there, it will change your life, Mike. It'll change your attitude every single day of your life, the way that you approach your daily life when you get up out of the bed and your feet hit the floor, if you'll begin to live and love and accept this verse. I want to show you this this morning. I was reading an article, and it was a couple weeks ago, and the article said this. For those, I love this. It said, for those who are in Christ Jesus, now, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but now there is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, now, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but now there is no condemnation. Somebody say amen. I thought, when I read it in this article, I thought, that's the best news I've ever heard. I, I, I know it, but I forget about it in my daily life. I forget about it when I continue to, to do stupid stuff and, and mess up. I've dealt with condemnation in, uh, in my own life. I've dealt with other people looking at me and walking in the door and saying, that's him right there. That's the one. He's the guy. Have any of you ever felt that way? That when you walked into a room, other people were looking at you and you felt like, uh-oh. I, I know that, that, that Romans 8.1 is true. And, you, and, and I, know, I, I don't want you to think this morning that I take every verse of scripture that I can find like Romans 8.28 or Romans 8.1 and I try to discount the verse. I really don't. What I want to do is I want to take that word, what it says, and I want it to become life inside of me. I want to take that and try to look at every aspect of that verse. And then when I need it, I'll know that that verse says, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord that are called according to his purpose. I can believe that now. I can believe it without a shadow of a doubt. I want to believe Romans 8, 1 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Last Saturday, I was, um, I was driving to a wedding. P.G. Chandler's daughter got married last, last weekend and had a beautiful wedding down on the beach. 
And when I'm in my car, I listen to music so, so much during the week and doing different things that when I get in a car, my kids will tell you, I never listen to the radio and listen to music. And it used to drive Erica and Kramer crazy because I would get in the car and I would, it was just like, thank you, Jesus. Nobody's singing to me right now. I'm not listening to anything. So I listen to talk radio or I listen to Christian radio or I listen to comedy radio. Or I listen to somebody talking to me while I'm in the car. And as long as somebody else is talking to me, Teresa's usually not. So that's even, I didn't, I didn't really mean that. I didn't really mean that. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for that this morning. But anyway, so last Saturday, Teresa wasn't even with me. But, but I was in my car and I was, with, and I was listening to the, the, a guy, his name was Tullian. And Byron helped me say this word, Chavigian. He's the senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it so happened that he was discussing the importance of preaching the gospel to yourself every single day. How that every single day you need a reawakening and a re-emerging of the word inside of you. And, and this, this isn't exactly what he said because I couldn't type it and I couldn't, I couldn't copy it or anything. So this is from memory what he said. He said this. Often we make the mistake of thinking that the gospel is simply what, be, what we believe in order to be saved. We hear it, we believe it, and we're born again. Though we shouldn't say it this way, we often act like the gospel sometimes has no further relevance to us. It gets us in the door, so to speak, but then it's just not part of our daily life. And then he went on to say something like this. He said, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day because every day we forget it. We forget it. We forget Romans 8, 1, when somebody comes in and begins to bash us over the head, that the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We forget. We forget the things that come. I heard somebody ask a question one time about no condemnation. And it said, how can we feel that there is no condemnation when we are continually told that God tests us? I always feel like I've failed his test and live under this feeling that I'm a disappointment to God. Any of you ever felt like that? Me too. Me too. I felt like, I feel like that I constantly disappoint him in, in my choices and the things that I say and the things that I do and, 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 and the places that I go. And I just feel like that I don't measure up somehow. He's the king of kings and, and lord of lords. And I'm a redneck preacher. And I just don't measure up to what I think his standards are. So I'm going to ask you, I want to ask you some things this morning. And I, it's in your handout. And you can write whatever you think. I'm continually being tested. True or false? True. <clears throat> I always feel that I have failed his test. You may feel that way, but it's really not true. It's not true because if it is true, then, then there is condemna condemnation. But he said there is therefore now how much condemnation? No, no there we go. But it's like if, we, if you get seven A's on your report card... And one D minus on your report card. A lot of times we tend to only focus on the D minus and not the seven A's. We don't focus that, you know, that we made A's in English and algebra and history and science. And we just didn't dress out for P.E. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, what a knucklehead. How can you get a D minus on your report card, Kramer? Just not dressing out. <laughs> Kramer said, I didn't get no D minus for PE. You're right. <clears throat> okay, the other thing is, I'm a constant disappointment to God. Absolutely not true. Write that in great big letters. You are not. You are the apple of his eye. He looks at you and says, that's somebody that I can love. That's somebody that I made in my own image. That's somebody that I want to hang out with. That's somebody that I want to live eternity with. You are not a disappointment to God. Can you say amen? amen. Say it. Say, I, I am not, am not a, disappointment a disappointment to my God. To my God. He loves me. He loves there you go. All right. What, what you probably mean in this is you're a disappointment to yourself. You're never a disappointment to him. But sometimes, man, we just don't feel like we do the right thing. We feel like we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we feel like we can never measure up to our own standards. I mean, I feel like, Manny, you should hit five out of six times. And when you get a hit like two for six, 
It disappoints you in yourself. And tomorrow night, I would like for you to go 0 for 6, if that's any consolation. And I would be so happy, and God would be so happy with you too, Manny. I just want you to know that. He loves you, and he cares for you. An 0 for 6 night from you tomorrow night, Manny, would just be a wonderful thing. Manny is a great ball player, and he plays for the other team. But um, 0 for 6, Manny, just keep thinking about that when you step up tomorrow night. Okay, let's look. How do we fit all this together? Number one, we have to accept, accept that what God says about us is true. We have to accept that what he says about us is true. If he says not condemned, then it's not condemned. That means that, that what the verse said a minute ago in Romans 8, 35, 37, 39, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. No matter what you've done, no matter what you did, no matter what you're going to do this afternoon, not even foolish or repeated mistakes, he, it will not allow him to separate you from himself. Number two, God's tests are not meant to destroy you. The tests that he brings are not meant to destroy you, but oftentimes they're to reveal our weaknesses so that we'll learn to trust him more. So that we'll find, hey man, you know what? I really didn't know that about myself. But next time that I go through this, I know that I can stand on that. So God's tests are not meant to destroy us, but just to reveal sometimes our weaknesses so that we can learn to trust him. And you know, sometimes in God's economy, you can write this down, failure sometimes is the back door to, to success. Sometimes when you fail over and over and over and you can't do it, you feel like you just can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, sometimes that is the best way to make you pull your boots on tighter and strap them down and say, you know what, I'm not going to fail anymore. I'm not going to fail anymore. I can do better than what I'm doing. I'm going to be better than what I am. I'm going to be a better man than what I am. I'm going to be a better woman than what I am. Can somebody say Amen. Failure sometimes knocks us in the rear end and says, hey, you can do better. All right. Number three, we aren't always the best judges of where we stand spiritually. Because we continue to knock ourselves down. We continue to think the worst of us. We continue to think that we could never do. We, I, I could never do that. I could never be that person. I could never be as good as what my dad and my mom are. I could never be as great a teacher as what my mom is. I could never be as great a person as what my dad is. But then my father in heaven looks at me and says, you're lovable. You're capable. You're forgivable. You're somebody that I want on my team. Personally, I would never think I can measure up. So really, we aren't the best judges. On our good days... You think about it. We're not as hot as we think we are, are we? And on our bad days, we're not as yucky as you think we are either. Better that, we should give up trying to rate ourselves and just try to be faithful every single day of our life. We need to stop trying to come up to some kind of rating system. Well, today I was 8.5. <laughs> just stop. And let the one that loves you most and cares about you most look at you and say, you know what? I know you mess up. I still love you. I know you've made a mess of today and you're probably going to make a mess of tomorrow. But there's therefore now no condemnation because you're in me. You're in me. All right. Number four. Life is always a mixture of success and failure. Can you say amen? Life. Life. What we do is life. When we get up in the morning, when we get up in the morning, our hair is freaking out. Looks all wild and woolly. Tangles must come out. <clears throat> right? Our life, our every day is a mixture of successes and failures. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. That some days you're the windshield. Some days you're what? The bug. That's from Genesis chapter 4. I believe. Hold on, let me check it out. But life is a mixture of success and failure. And you know, I, I feel like in my life that sometimes successes come in small doses just to give me some hope. You know what I mean? Just to give me a little bit of hope that I can make it through tomorrow. It's like, yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Anybody else ever ride on that road with me? Sometimes it may just teach us humility and make us develop our trust in God. I want to recommend something for you. Like I said a minute ago. Write down Romans 8.1. Stick it somewhere where you can see it. Repeat it to yourself every day. It's a foundation for spiritual progress in your life. 
And sometimes it's easy to believe for somebody else that you can talk to and say, hey man, don't worry about it. The Bible says there's therefore now no condemnation. You're in Christ, you love Jesus. But we need a constant reminder. I need a constant reminder in my life that he's not gonna bash me in the head with a hammer every time I mess up. That, there's, that he's not walking behind me, you know, like the Three Stooges. And I'm walking along, he goes, ah, ah. When every time you mess up, does anybody else feel that way? I mean, not that God's one of the Three Stooges. I don't, I don't think that, but, okay. So let's look. Let's look at what this verse really means. And then we're gonna find two things, two real truths that I believe in this. Two truths. Number one. There is a struggle in the Christian life. There is a struggle in the Christian life. In, in Romans chapter 7, chapter before chapter 8, which I figured that out by myself. In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, Paul said this. And, and again, and I'm going to paraphrase those 11 verses, 12 verses. He said, in my mind, Paul, Paul was saying this. Now look, he said, in my mind, I really want to please God. But there's something inside of me that makes me seem like I always do the opposite. I mean, that's, what, that's the Apostle Paul. Do you know who wrote most of the New Testament? Who? Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he says, you know what? I really try. I really am trying with everything in me, God, to do everything that you want me to do. But it seems like there's something inside of me that always makes me want to do the opposite. Remember Flip Wilson used to always say what? The devil made me do it. And some of you teenagers are going, who? <laughs> Flip who? He had a show on TV. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Paul said, there's something inside of me that's always trying to make me do what I feel like I shouldn't do. In the morning, we get up and say, Lord, today's your day. I'm your servant and I want to do your will today. Today, Lord, I'm going to set up some things that I can do for you today in your kingdom. Then something happens through today and we skip number one. And we kind of bypass number two and we halfway do number three. And we maybe get the most out of number four, but then we don't do number five at all. And then by nine o'clock, we're saying, Lord, I'm not going to lose my temper. It's nine o'clock in the morning. At 10.30, you're slicing and dicing and you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm just not going to gossip anymore today. And then by 1.30, 2 o'clock, we've blown that one too. And the very thing that we said we were going to do, we don't do. And the thing we said we would never do that day, we do more than once. Anybody else do that? Look at the person beside you and say, I know you do it. Raise your hand. That's it. So for a minute, some of you have lived it this week. You, you had the best intentions, but then by one o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, forget this day. Lord, hey Lord, I'll do what I can do for you tomorrow. Today, I pretty much messed this one up. But he still says, what does Roman 8, 1 say? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, now let's look back. <clears throat> I'm going to back up just a little bit. I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit more about what Paul was saying leading up to that verse. If you look, if you, if you want to go home this afternoon and read or, or this week and read chapter 7. Chapter 7 is kind of an autobiography of, of, what, of what Paul's experience of a Christian believer is. And, and I don't, if you read it, I don't see it as being Paul being a defeated or a subnormal Christian or as a non-Christian or as a person un, under conviction. I believe that, that Romans 7 kind of just is one stage, one part of what a normal Christian will experience. Now, I don't believe that Romans 7, if you go back and read it, is a total story of all the Christian life. But I do believe, I do believe that we, should, we shouldn't throw it out and says it has no bearing on us. Let's be honest. You can be a great Christian as the Apostle Paul was, and you can at the same time struggle a great deal with your walk with God. How, how can I say that? It's a pastor. How can you say that? How can I say if, if I'm going to write most of the New Testament, how can I struggle with my walk? Because if you'll read in chapter 7 of the book of Romans, Paul struggled. He had a difficult time. There's a struggle that's part of your walk with God. There's a pull of what God wants you to do in the spiritual world and what you do in the fleshy world. Somebody say amen. 
Thank God it's not the whole story, but it is part of the story. And even in, in, in the 24th verse of, of, of the seventh chapter, Paul said this, look, oh, wretched man that I am. Some of you have said that this week. You hadn't said it maybe in those words. Oh, wretched man. I mean, you could say, here's the Wesley version. I stink. I'm horrible. I can never measure up. But Paul said, oh, wretched man. But he, he's not talking about just himself. He's talking about me. And he's talking about some of you. And we struggle in different ways. We struggle between what we know to do and what we actually do. Become, with our, our better desires and our lesser desires. What God wants us to do and what God would have us do. How many of you know that we live in a world that's cursed? From the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, we've been living in a world that's a sin-cursed world. A world that is cursed with sin. And a true enemy that is going to come against you every single day and try to put a stamp of condemnation on you. Somebody say amen. amen. That's his job. It wouldn't be true to what I believe the Word of God says that anyone, look at this, Anyone who tells you that struggle does not belong in the Christian life actually really don't have a biblical view of what it means to live a Christian life. Because the Bible says it's a tough place. It's a sin-cursed world. Now, can we live above it? Absolutely. Can we live in victory? Absolutely. Can we live in healing? Absolutely. Can we live in that we've never, ever sinned? Absolutely. But it's tough every single day of your life. Because the enemy comes to what? Steal kill and to destroy he is coming to put you down and put a stamp of condemnation on you every single day but my Jesus said I've come to not condemn you and give you life and give you life more abundantly somebody say amen again amen. that is good preaching <laughs> but I think if Paul if he struggled then maybe I will too if he questions his everything that he he's doing then maybe I will too I love Jesus I'm a follower of Jesus but there's a time sometimes that, that we struggle. Some, sometimes people come and they give, give their heart and they, they turn everything over. And, and they say, God, I want to be everything that you want me to be. God, I, I really want to turn it over this time to you. And then things don't go well. And then they have a relationship problem or a financial difficulty or a personal difficulty or an emotional difficulty. And maybe they get discouraged because of a situation with a saint. And they get disillusioned about what the church really is. They get angry with that person that even led them to the Lord. Or they get angry with God because of the, the things, the cards that they've been dealt in their life. And then they begin to say, God, what's wrong with me? I thought I came and bore my soul. I thought I came and bore my heart out at the altar. What in the world? It's worse now than before I accepted you. Often there's nothing deeply wrong with you if you're going through a time of struggle. Because number one says, there's going to be a struggle with the Christian life. There's going to be a struggle from the day that you give your heart and life to Christ until the day that he comes back. It's going to be a tough deal. It ain't going to be all roses. But hallelujah, the victor is living inside of us that says, no matter what you do, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you mess up, I will forgive you and I will not condemn you. Shoo! I love that. Number two. Number two. Yeah! That struggle is without condemnation. There is a struggle. And it's going to be tough. And days we're not going to want to go on. But it does not have to be with condemnation. Yes. There is therefore now no, nada, none, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Everything else he says all the way through from verse 1 of chapter 8 all the way through verse 39 is simply a reinstatement, a restatement of no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation. If you look at this verse in the Greek and switch it all around, they, they put the, the, in the Greek it puts the word no. Our, our version says, there is therefore now no. It's the how many word? There is therefore now no. In the Greek, the word is at the very beginning. And it says, no condemnation. None. No condemnation. It's the very first word of the sentence. It's saying, look, nada, none. Don't worry about it. 
There is no condemnation, none whatsoever for the believer in Christ Jesus. Look at the verse. I want you to say that with me. There is, put the next slide. There you go. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me see if I can explain it, what it don't mean, what it doesn't mean. And then I'll try to tell you what it does. Look at this. He's not saying there is therefore now no cause for condemnation. Let me try that again. He's not saying there is therefore now no cause for condemnation. Because you fail, I fail. I stumble, you stumble. You fall, I fall. You get off the path, I get off the path. And sometimes we're barely making it. Paul is not saying there is no cause for condemnation in us. Because on any given day, if God were to look down from heaven and were to judge us moment by moment, is there anybody else in here that he would find plenty to bash you over the head for? Mike, yes. No, so I see some more of you. Is Paul saying that there is therefore now no failure to those that are in Christ Jesus? Nope. There is therefore now no struggle to those who are in Christ Jesus? Nope. Is he saying there is no stumbling to those that are in Christ Jesus? No. He is saying there is therefore now no condemnation, no punishment, no coming into judgment, no penal servitude for the follower of Jesus Christ. Shoo! Yes! None, nada, there is no condemnation when you come to Christ. What does it mean? You may stumble, you may fall, you may trip, you may make a thousand mistakes, you may sin, and we do. You may get off the path, you may go astray, we may have a thousand problems. But for the believer in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation because God has said so. Amen. You can struggle, but you're not condemned. You can fall, but you're not condemned. You can trip, but you're not condemned. Can anybody go to, to the K&W today and tell what I've talked about? No condemnation. You may go astray. None. So today, there's good news for us that are prodigal sons. So what does that mean? It means there's no rejection for the believer. No rejection. God's not going to reject you because you struggle. Most of you know the, pro- the story of the prodigal son. If you don't, I'll just kind of kind of paraphrase it. He was in his father's house. And he went off to a far country. And there in that country, he developed riotous living. He spent all of his inheritance and he ended up in the pig pen. Literally in a pig pen. Not just like your dorm room. But he hit the very bottom He went from the son that had it all to the very bottom. He left his family. He squandered everything that he had ever had. And today he's living with the pigs. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said this. What's the difference between a pig and a man in the pig pen? The pig just keeps on eating the husks. After a while, a man's going to say, I will arise and go to my father. So where was the father when the son returned home? Not in the house. The Bible says he was on the road, on his way to meet him when he was coming down the road. You see, that is a perfect picture of no rejection to those that are in Christ Jesus. No matter how bad you've squandered your inheritance, no how bad you've lived, Jesus is walking down the road with his hand outstretched saying, Come on home, son. Come on home, son. Come on home, son. Yes. Come on home, son. Even if you wander or go astray or have been living a long time, listen to me, you may have been living a long time in the far country. And maybe you're just embarrassed because you've squandered the spiritual inheritance of God's kingdom. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you've been living in a pig pen. And you're scared to death to turn back because you think God's going to condemn you. You know what? Remember this. God already knows everything you've ever done and everything you've ever dreamed of doing, and he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. You're still in his family. The moment that you say, I will arise and go to my father, 
then he's going to say, hey, boys, kill the fatted calf. My son's coming home. Let's have a party. My son's coming home. Do you see him coming over the hill over there? I already went out to meet him, but I wanted to, meet him. I wanted to hurry back and, and beat, him, beat him to the house. Because I want to have something ready for him when he comes back. Because I know what he's done. You don't have to tell me what he's done. I know what's, what's been going on in his life. But I want the very best for my son because I love him. And I'm not going to condemn him for where he's been. I'm going to forgive him. And we're going to have a party because my son has come home. The father in heaven and his son are waiting right now for you to come home. For you to say, you know what, God? I've done it. And I'm embarrassed to say that I've done it, but I want to come home. My son that was lost has been found. He was away, but now he's come home. So what do we do when we fail? Sometimes we make dumb mistakes over and over and over again. We repent and by God's grace, our eyes are open to see what we've done. We changed our minds. We change our minds. We stop making excuses. We, can, we confess God to others and we seek God's help. And we ask others to help us. And we ask God to help us move forward. And sometimes we think, when I'm a failure, and we conclude God might hate us. And it's true, our sin will separate us from a close walk with God. But it cannot reverse the divine proclamation of no condemnation. The sin that you're living in, it may separate you from a close walk with God. It may get you to a place where you don't feel his presence like you one did. But it cannot reverse the proclamation that there is no condemnation. Whoo, I love that. You're not going to feel as close to him as you once did if you're living in sin. It's time for you to get your mess together and repent and come back to him. Let him kill the fatted calf and have a party for you coming. But it doesn't change the word. It doesn't reverse that proclamation that says no condemnation. So Christian growth, look at this. Christian growth, in other words, doesn't happen first by behaving better. Now look at this. It doesn't happen first by behaving better, but believing better. Believing better. Believing in bigger, deeper, brighter ways of what Christ has already secured for you. Amen. You don't have to get cleaned up. And then come and say, okay, God, I'm all good. Now I'm clean. I'm fixed. I'm not doing what I used to do. I'm not doing the things that I used to do. No! Come as you are. Come as you are. Begin to believe him more. Sometimes it's hard for me to believe that God really loves me when I look in the mirror. Because in my life and in your life, I know there's plenty of things that God could hit us over the head for. But he's still saying, there is no condemnation. You know, you know, sometimes we sing this at the end of the services. Jesus paid it all, all to him I Oh, right. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Do we really believe it that Jesus paid it all? If so, if we really believe that, then there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this. If, if our debt was paid... It was paid, and there is an end of it. A second payment cannot be demanded. If Jesus paid it all, then we can't expect him to come and pay again something he's, what? Already paid for. If he's come and he said, sin, gone, then that's it. He's paid for it. So let me ask you something this morning. Is Jesus enough for you? If he's enough for you, then there's no punishment. There might be discipline. Look at me. There might be discipline. There might be correction. It might be very painful. But there's no punishment. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, read the 12th chapter of Hebrews 4 through 11. There's no harsh or no abrasive punishment. I remember many years ago, Kramer, Kramer played baseball. And I did my very best to teach Kramer to play baseball. And Kramer is such a better athlete than I am or ever dreamed of being. He's a great athlete. And when, when it got to a certain point where I couldn't teach him anything else. I mean, not about baseball, but <laughs> no, but I couldn't teach him anymore. So I got to the point where I had to find somebody that knew more than he did about baseball. So I know it's hard to believe, but I got TJ. <laughs> so, so TJ and I, we coached a little league team together. 
His son Lance was on the team. Kramer's on the team. And you know, it, it's amazing. I don't know how, how many of you have ever coached like girls or guys, little, little kids ball. Isn't it amazing that a kid can stand up there and a ball come this high over his head and he's swinging for the fence and then one will come right down the middle and he goes. <laughs> and you're in the dugout screaming. You're screaming. You're saying, stay, don't run. And what do they do? And you say, go! And they do what? Freeze. I remember one time, TJ was in one of our games. And we had a kid in, out, in, in our outfield. I don't know how many of you, D David Phelps, I love what he says. I asked him, he said, David, did you ever play organized baseball or anything? Because he's a fabulous singer. He said, yeah. He said, I was a kid in the right field sitting on my glove. <laughs> anyway. But there was this, this one particular game that we were playing. And TJ is telling this kid, move up. Move up. Come up. And this kid's just standing there. And, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, coaches. But you say, come in. And they go, come in. Come. And so TJ's walking down the right field line, screaming and yelling. This big kid, I don't remember who this kid was. This big kid came up. And, and of course, the kid in outfield was just terrified. Crushes the ball. The kid standing out there moved up eight millimeters from where he was to begin with. And the ball comes right at him, goes right between his legs. I mean, didn't hit him, just came right at him. And TJ's walking up the line, nice try, nice try. TJ walks back in the dugout and I said, what? He didn't move a muscle. He didn't move at all. The outfielder's standing out there, he's petrified. The ball goes right between his legs. TJ said, yeah. But it didn't hit him in the face. <laughs> nice try. Next time you'll catch it. So the kid comes in. TJ's going, that's all right, buddy. You did good. Next time you'll catch it. And the kid kind of looks up at TJ with a half grin. I did pretty good, didn't I, coach? <laughs> it's the same thing God does when we mess up. He helps us back up. He knows that the ball went right through our legs. He knows that he tried to tell us to get out of the way and move right where the ball was coming because he already knew what you were going to be going through before the ball was hit. He helps you back up. He brings you back in. He puts us back in the game. And he looks at you and says, next time. Next time. At least he didn't hit you in the face. That's what Paul said when he said there's no condemnation. You see, sometimes we have, because of the things that we've been through, we have guilt. We didn't make the play. We were at the wrong place at the wrong time. We feel like, God, come on. I, I know I missed it. I know we lost the game because of me. But sometimes we're in a place where he can teach us and tell us, hey, you know what? It's okay. It's all right. Listen to my call next time when I tell you to move up. You'll be at the right place in the right time. For those who know Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Because your sins are gone. Because Jesus condemns sin by his death on the cross. And if he condemns sin by death on the cross, God will never condemn you. The devil comes to us day in and day out and says, condemned, condemned, condemned. And God's on the other side saying, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. I'll put you back in the game. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. So who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the enemy or you're going to believe God? You got to make up your own mind. Donald Gray Barnhouse has a statement about this. And I want you to see this. He said this. A soul that comes to the full realization that he ought to be in hell, but in that reality, the Lord Jesus took his hell. And there is therefore now, 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 no condemnation for him who is in, because he is in Christ Jesus, is likely to be quite moved by the truth. If members of the human race are permitted to yell because their team won a football game, because their candidate won an election, because they have won $50 on a horse race, because their drilling has produced a gusher, let us shout for joy because we are in Christ Jesus and there is therefore now no condemnation for us now. 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 
Now, I can't think of a more encouraging spiritual truth that I can give to you today, that I can share with you. For those that are in Christ Jesus now, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but right now, there is no condemnation. Three things, and this is my closing. Three things that will remain no matter how bad you struggle. No matter how bad you struggle and what you're struggling with. You're secure in your eternity. As long as you're in Christ Jesus, as long as you're in as a believer, you can rest assured that there's a place that Christ has prepared for you for eternity forever. He said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be what? Also, I want you to be there with me. I want you to hang out with me. A place of no condemnation is prepared for you. What God demands of you, he supplies. He demands a perfect sacrifice for sin. He gave us Jesus. He provided that through his son and the death of his son. Let me tell you this. If a child of God ever goes to hell, then God's a liar. Because God has said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He said, I've made a way for you, child of God. I've made a way that you can turn from your wickedness and walk to the altar. Number two, you're internally free. You're internally free. You're not bound anymore. You're not graded on a curve of performance in order to earn his grace. He said, just come. Just come like you are. You don't have to clean up. It's a free gift. It's been given freely. And number three. Number three, you are positionally perfect. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? When God looks at you, he sees the blood of Jesus. You are in the right place at the right time, covered by his blood. So, who is it that are not condemned? Those that are in Christ Jesus. When it comes to salvation, look at this. When it comes to your salvation, there's only two places you can be. You're either outside of Christ or you're in Christ. There is no, no other place. There's no middle ground. You're either doing what you're supposed to be doing, living in Christ, or you're outside. You say, man, that's hard. Yep. I didn't make the rules. I'm just giving them. Right? All right keep, I'm almost finished. I want to ask you something this morning. If you're outside of Christ, John 3.18 says that you're already condemned. But if you're in Christ, you're never condemned. If you're outside of Christ, if you're not living right, then there's a judgment that's waiting for you eventually. But if you're in Christ, he says, I'm not going to condemn you anymore when you come and ask forgiveness. Your judgment's behind you. It's in the past. You've come and asked forgiveness, and I've said no more. You've already been judged. Why? Because Jesus came and died on the cross for my sin. My judgment was taken by the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Son of the living God. So I'm going to ask you something this morning. Where are you? Where are you? Are you outside? Are you outside of where Christ wants you to be this morning? Or are you in? Are you in? Because if you're in, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are what? In. In. You think, man, there's a lot of things in my life I really still feel condemned for. Maybe you ain't in. Maybe you're out. Are you outside of Christ and lost? You think, man, I, I've already walked the aisle. I, I, I know, I, I, I've already come down and given my heart to Christ. But there's just things in my life that aren't right. Oh, you're out. You're out. He said, are you in? If you're in, you're not condemned. If you're not sure and don't know where you stand, you can be in this morning. You can embrace the, Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ this morning. If you're outside this morning and you think, man, I, there's no way I can get back in. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. All it does, all it requires is saying yes. And when you come, when you come, you're going to find the most liberating experience of your life. And that's him looking at you and saying, Gene, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something, Gene? Can I tell you something, Jeffrey? There is therefore now no condemnation for you 
because you are in. You're in. You're in. You don't have to feel out anymore. You're in. I don't know about you. I don't want to feel condemnation in my life. I want to be at a place that he can look at me and say, he's covered by the blood. He's covered by the blood. And because he's covered by the blood and he is my son's, I don't have to st stamp a stamp of condemnation. I can stamp a stamp on him that says, forgiven child of the living God. Will you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> I'm only going to keep you a minute and I'm only going to ask one thing. Are you in? Or are you out? If you're out, you need to come. If you're in, you need to pray for those that are out. I'm just going to ask you this morning. If you want to ever feel a more freeing place in your life of no condemnation, then you need to get in. You need to get in with me this morning. Somebody else. In or out. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to hold your head down. It's honesty. It's being honest with yourself. Saying, I don't want to feel like this anymore. If I'm in, I don't feel like it. If I'm out, I do feel like it. It's not, can't be any simpler. Anybody else? Anyone else? Come real quick. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Still someone else that needs to come. I feel it in my heart. In or out. Life or death. It's a little tougher, isn't it? Anyone else? You bow your heads with me this morning. Vivian. Pray for me, Viv. Father, we thank you that your word tells us is in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6. As we submit ourselves to you, to resist the devil, and he'll flee from thank us. You, Jesus. How we thank you this morning, your word didn't say that he will fight us. You said that once we submitted ourselves to you, 
and resist the devil, that he would flee from us. So we thank you for the heritage that we have this morning as believers in you. We believe the authority of your word, and we take this moment to submit ourselves totally to you, spirit, soul, and body. We join with these who've gathered themselves at the altar, and we thank you, Lord, that you're the true and living God, and that because that we are in you, that there's freedom in you, and you said that we would know the truth, and it would set us free. And may we understand this morning that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we understand the enemy who has come to resist us. So we thank you for the authority of your word. And we plead the blood of Jesus over every single person who's gathered in this place this day. And we thank you for who we are in you. That we are new creations. That we have been bought and paid with a price. We thank you, Lord, that this was too big of a debt for us. So the Savior came all the way from glory. Lived his life selflessly and pure and blameless before you. And we thank you that he is the perfect sacrifice. And this morning Morning. We find our deliverance in you. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you this day for safety, for deliverance, for preservation, for healing, and for soundness in mind. And when we leave out of this place this day, we thank you that your grace has been sufficient. And you have gone before us to make every crooked place straight. How we thank you, God, for your mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you for your mercies, which have been made new this very day. We thank you for the freedom that we have in you. God, we pray you. We lift your name on high. We proclaim in this place that you are the king of kings. You are the great I am. You are the prince of peace. You are the everlasting one. We thank you, Lord, that your light shines in darkness and darkness can never extinguish your light and that we live in you and we move in you and we have our freedom in you this day. We remind ourselves that the battle is not ours, but through you we shall do valiantly for it is you that treads down our enemies. How we thank you, God. How we celebrate your goodness in this place and in our lives we worship you God for your word that you receive our thanksgiving and praise we offer this to you in the wonderful name of Jesus and everyone said amen, amen. Yeah. I want you to do one thing look at the screens and say that with me say it there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus I want you to look at somebody and just tell them this say I'm in. I love you. See you.